So my name is Steph. I am a UX. I led a past life as a UI developer, but sadly not anymore. Um, I've done some work sort of on sort of conceptual design side as well as research side. And today we're going to talk about the hidden plot device. And so in the spring of 2013, I was in a Belgrade for a conference. Now, uh, anyone here from Belgrade? So I can't see very well either. So I'm just going to have to pretend. <laughs> Thank you. No one from Belgrade? One or two, I think. Um, so it's a fascinating place. I had never been there before, and I had no idea what to expect. It wasn't strictly a research trip from, say, someone who, like me who does field research. Um, but it's kind of hard to lose the habit when you go into a place that you don't know. And so um, it's one of the things I learned about Belgrade. It's a very ancient city. It's a prehistoric site. It has been battled over 115 times and raised to the ground 44 times to give you an idea of, of you know, how it had a violent past. And so this picture I took was from the top of the fortress, the old Belgrade for fortress, with a name I can't quite pronounce correctly, so someone else can correct me later, it's um, Kalamegdan. Um, so I thought this was you know, a decent picture until I went on Wikipedia, and um, someone has had the beautiful day and took a wonderful photo, and someone else has done a lovely sunset. I'm like, okay, right, I should just give up photography. Um, <clears throat> the, um, well, so when I do these kinds of trips, and I go to a place I don't know, I actually rather not stay in a hotel. Uh, I love Airbnb. I'm sorry, New York. Um, because you just get the experience of what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. You can pretend to live in a city that you haven't been in. So I, it's, I did the same thing. I know, like, you know, sort of um, Belgrade, I know nothing about it. It's probably not the safest thing to have done, but, you know, whatever. Um, I rented a small Airbnb apartment. The owner was super nice. He was uh, an older man. Um, he took me to the local market, and you see things like um, people were just selling second-hand clothes on, on the ground, on a piece of canvas, and food was extremely cheap. So, um, so to give you an idea, four days in Belgrade, it was cheaper than my lunch at the airport in Geneva on my way home. The apartment was quite cool, except for this weird bit. Um, so this, to give you an idea, <laughs> this is above the kitchen, um, in the kitchen. So this is like a whole floor that you couldn't get up to. And I, I thought I could try, I, I, liked, no, I tried the kitchen chair and everything, um, but I thought it would be really bad if I couldn't get back down, so um, I didn't do that. It's just sort of stuff of nightmares. Um, so I tried to ignore that and spend less time in the kitchen as little as possible. Um, I know nothing about the Serbian language, which is a bit sad, but one of the things I did notice is that every second shop I could read the name of, because I, I know Latin. Um, and so, but. It turns out that Serbian language is the only language now that uses both the Cyrillic and the Latin alphabet. So you get stuff like this, which you think you should be able to read, but you can't. Um, so I don't know language. I couldn't engage with the locals, which made me a bit sad. But it turns out that there's another um, type of local that I could speak to. Um, so it turns out that cat is a universal language. Who would have known? And so before I show you the next video, I'm going to change your life forever because I'm just going to teach you a few things that will help you interpret internet cat videos better. Um, so <laughs> some of you must be cat people. I I'm making that guess. So this is the language of cats. If you do a little blink to a cat, um, what you're saying to the cat is, um, I'm not going to hurt you. It's a non-threatening gesture. And so if a cat blinks at you on the street, it's just saying, you know what, um, you do your thing, I do my thing, we're fine, we're chill, we're cool. The other thing that you have to know about this is, um, you know how like cats do this thing with their ears? They've got little satellite ears, and they're just like independent of each other? Um, in cat language, when they flip both ears back, it's the equivalent in cat of, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> Dogs, if you have dogs, they do the kind of little, tilt, really cute head tilt. It's the same thing, but for cats. OK, so the, uh, this guy just stuck to me. So <clears throat> this is a funny thing. Stories are so close to us that we can't actually see them for what they are. And um, what, what is a story? Why is it that we pay attention to stories? In the paper published, so believe it or not, someone's actually studied this. In the paper published at the end of 1980, two scientists from the University of Illinois, um, William Brewer and Edward Lichtenstein, just to get my names right, they took apart stories of similar lengths and they tested on lots and lots of psychology students to say, okay, which ones of these are stories? And not to bore you with a 100-page academic paper, but basically the findings are like this. 
people believe they have heard a story or experienced a story if you have had a sense of conflict and if you have a sense of you know, having to struggle a little bit, and, but you end up in a safe place at the end. It's a very, very specific formula for what we identify as story. But now what is supremely fascinating to me is, and I've done this kind of thing many, many, many times, and I know it works. There is something about when we think we're hearing a story that we start paying attention even before we know it's a story. Um, John Lacar said something quite poignant. So, I know cats being a theme here, right? The cat sat on the mat is not the beginning of a story, but the cat sat on the dog's mat is. And, and I've had to explain this quote to someone who says, so why is that a story? And it's like, well, you know, if the cat sat there and the dog came, you have something interesting that's going to happen. It's the premise and the beginning of a story, and then we start paying attention to just the beginning of what a story is. So it's like a switch that's triggering in our brains. And we've struggled to explain this to ourselves. Oh, here we go. So are we programmed or are we hardwired? This is a phrase you hear a lot if you have done, you know, if you've been obsessing about stories like I have. Everyone says we're programmed through, this is um, Jonas Sachs, he says we're programmed through our evolutionary biology to be birth consumers, creators of story. Um, and you hear this a lot. The word hardwired comes up a lot and usually it's accompanied by a story about our ancestors telling stories to each other around the campfire. I wasn't satisfied with this explanation. I thought, like, it's just like, oh, let's just you know, say, oh, we're hardwired, there you go. No, we just accept it. I don't like accepting things. Um, <clears throat> it took me a while to hunt down somebody who could explain it. And this is a book that was so big it couldn't fit in my luggage, so I couldn't read it out to you. Um, it's by Brian Boyd, and he posed some interesting theories about how we evolved this particular skill. I mean, like, how did we come from, you know, a caveman ape to be able to touch other stories. It's a little bit of a process. Um, so essentially, he basically says, we evolve this thing, this ability to tell stories in order for us to process really complex information, especially social information, how we relate to each other, you know, who's, uh, who's, the, who's the head of the clan, and therefore we have to respect it, uh, who is lying behind their backs, um, that kind of thing. So these. It allows us to create models to deal with really, really complex social situations. <clears throat> and so, stories are a cognitive framework that helps us make sense of our world. Brian Board actually says something even far more interesting, and um, he talks about it in terms of dolphins and play, and I know that um, Ben talked about play yesterday as human beings, but animals play too. And as it turns out, so let me try and simplify this. If, you know how, sorry, more cats, um, if a cat plays with a toy, how does the cat know that it's a toy and not a real mouse? If a dog catches a stick, how does the dog know that this is play and not an enemy? And when you think about things at that level, you realize actually, you know what, all of us mammals with a social uh, relationship to each other, we have this capacity to create fiction. It's the thing that allow allows us to lie, but it's also the capacity that allows us to tell stories and to create stories and to understand stories. Um, Dan and Cheap here in their book, Come to Stick, talks about it in a really interesting way. They talk about how it also becomes a way for us to simulate situations. So, and I'm just reading out a quote that I haven't got here because it's really long. Um, it works because we can't imagine events or sequences without evoking the same modules of the brain that are evoked in real physical activity. So when you watch a video, when you talk to somebody and learn what they went through, you're basically mirroring how they felt, and that's how we as human beings learn really, really efficiently. So you think, okay, is this a universal thing? Do we have universal stories? Um, this is also funny because we've spent several thousand, well, let's just say two, 2,000 years on this particular question. Aristotle was the first known person to try and identify different types of stories. Um, he came up with four, but that's all we know because some of his work was lost. Um, Norman Friedman is an American author, and his, uh, his particular model has been used a few times sort of in people who work, work, work on fiction, um, and uh, he comes up with 14. Robert McKee is a much more well-known name. He is uh, responsible for a screenwriting bible called Story. Um, and, uh, and he, I, because he was working in the film, he identified 25. And we've been at this question, how many stories do we have as a civilization for over 2,000 years? And we cannot agree. 
sorry, I don't have any answers today because if I did, I probably would be making a lot more money than I do now. Um, but, so there is something interesting here, something about us, and maybe the day that we understand all the stories there are in the world, we'll just be bored. So who knows? I want to share with you um, Kurt Vonnegut's take on the shape of stories. It's just so good that it's just, you no, know, we just have to spend some time watching this and, and learning what he says. Um, so one of the funny things about this is actually he presented this uh, as a thesis to University of Chicago, if I got it right, um, and it was rejected because it, he thought it was maybe a bit too much fun and too simple. Three lessons for Vonnegut. He had a slightly different way of looking at story shapes. Now, firstly, you realize that when you actually take apart what he's doing there, he's giving each story from an individual perspective. It's extremely important. I'll come back to that. The second thing he does is that he talks about story shapes in terms of emotional energy. Um, it's measured in terms of tension and conflict and things that don't go quite right. As I said in the very, very beginning, is what gives us what a story is. We understand it through the shape of the emotional energy. And there's this weird thing where he he, his own, uh, when he actually talks about his own thesis, it's actually fa um, far more different story types, but here he chose to tell it in threes. And there's something really odd about threes when it comes to the structure of stories. And again, the mystery dippens, and I will tell you a little bit more later. So this is my reproduction of his curves, and you notice that um, it either crosses the x-axis three times or is in three parts. There is something about stories that needs to be in three parts. Well, there is the beginning, middle, and end. So many of you, I'm guessing, have seen this before. This is kind of classic stuff they tell you every time you encounter anything about storytelling. Just to remind you what it is. So act one is the place where the first part of the story, in the timeline-wise, in the sequence where you set things up, what is the context, where are we, who are we listening to, who's the main character, what does he or she want? And in the second part is where um, the protagonist, the person that we're listening to, the character we're empathizing with, um, why are they not getting what they want and what are they doing to, about it? And so having that conflict and that tension in that second part. The third part of any usual story is where, oops, things get as intense as they go. And uh, when I sort of like, you know, distill it down to a curve, it looks kind of like this and looks really, really boring. But Every single Hollywood movie you've seen, probably, or at least in the last little while, fits this curve. Every single, every single TV series per episode probably very likely fits this curve. And it, because it's a series, it will have sort of like, you no, know, several versions of this built on top of each other all the way through a season and probably across several seasons. So um, uh, a book like The Hunger Games does this particularly well. It's almost textbook where the turning points are and where the moments are. It's all very well to talk about the shape of stories. How do we use it? In a place like user experience, where and how can we use this? So, <clears throat> um, this is not in contradiction to Aaron's graph from earlier, mostly because in my head I also, I think in terms of UX, in two different things that we're trying to do. Um, first, what I generally loosely call research is, for me, the set of things we do where we identify the problem space is what we do to understand things better in order to design for it. Um, and I'm loose, I know that I'll probably get hell from this from somebody, but um, design here for me also includes the skill set of prototyping and building and developing and making it real. So for me, that's the solution space. That's the, the bit there you come up with the stuff that is the real thing. And the problem space is where you spend time trying to understand what is it that you're trying to solve. Um, what we're doing in user experience sort of have these little tasks that fit into these buckets. And uh, did I just click that or not? No, there you go. <clears throat> um, we have jobs where we, we have things to do where we actually spend time listening, gathering the real information, and then we spend a bit of time, um, and most of the user experience tools that you know probably fall into this process, where we interpret the information in such a way that will facilitate the design. So um, the, the video that Aaron showed you, which is Eliza, is a form of modeling, is a very innovative form of retelling the story that you find out in the field into a way that will facilitate design activities. And uh, in design is where we express ourselves, explore our solutions. So I'm going to go through this in detail, but the things that we do, when you really, really start to think about what is it that we do when we create digital things or even non-digital things, 
when we're designing, what we're really doing is we're helping people make better decisions. Now, the decisions could be as big as whether I should buy this house, whether this information is uh, enough for me to help me decide whether I should buy this house. Or it could be as, should I be clicking this button? So we're talking about really micro decisions and very big ones. And in the same token, when we conduct research, what we're trying to do is just to understand if we are helping people make the correct decisions, either at the micro button, drop down, text level, content level, or at a much bigger level where they make you know, big life decisions. The challenge is we're not rational creatures. And so we've come from this place where traditional lab-based usability testing we have a really solid foundation and a lot of law to grow from. So people like Jacob Newsom has written a lot about this, and certainly the Newsom Norman group, about how what you do is not necessarily what you say. So this is like a given bottom line. But beyond that, we know actually, let me give you an example. How did you decide to come to Beyond Tolerant? Do you remember? What is it that made you decide you want to be here today? Uh, and decisions could be, um, could be as early as, oh, this morning, oh, I'll just skip the first two sessions, I'll sleep in. Well, I guess if you're sleeping, you won't be here. Sorry, I didn't make that right. Um, but so if you are, um, who was it that told you it was a good conference that you should be here? Was it a tweet? Was it a person? Where were you? So like the particular context, was it a, someone that you respected in a, you know, in a workplace, which obviously has a huge, larger sway than, say, someone you met casually in a pub on a Saturday or in a bar? And so understanding this context of how people make decisions is why story is extremely important. Because in the end, it is the way that we model our lives. Why don't we use it more? It's a bit of mystery. So the question is how and when. When can we use it? The part where we listen and gather data, we, are lot, we have a lot of tools already. We have things like surveys, interviews, we have big data at our disposal now. We use analytics. We have plenty, plenty of tools to understand our customers and listen to them. Um, where a story framework could also fit in is actually in a variety of mix of these tools. Um, it is one way where you can get a full picture of what you want from your design research. So is it influential people? Is it causality? What's A, B, and C? Like, what are the things in order that helps you make this decision? And what's your particular circumstance? One way to think, now, did I say that three is a magic number? That's this weird thing, I don't know. Maybe um, there's a numerology thing happening here. Where, so characters, <clears throat> so Greg Moss is a teacher in writing fiction. He teaches short fiction, novel length, uh, long works, but he also himself is a ghostwriter. So um, <clears throat> he came up with this particular model to teach people how to write and how to look for stories. And basically he says, you know what, most stories happen in between three places, between a character and a place, a place and a plot, and a plot and character. So plot being a time-based thing. And um, the usual thing is, if you weren't at that place at that time, would the story still happen? It's a very sort of deeply philosophical approach, but so simplified. This is a really good model for what you're looking for when you conduct a research like, across the board to make sure you capture all the information across three different points. I'm going to show you really quickly an interview technique. Um, if you want to find more about this, you can find it out at jobstobedone.org. So Chris and Bob, um, they also actually coached us at MailChimp at the time with this particular interview technique. And it's really different from most of the stuff you see in textbooks out there about how to conduct usability testing or user research because they interrogate. This is a, an interview where they uh, spoke to someone who was recorded in Cambridge a few years ago um, who was struggling to buy a mobile phone or, or cell phone. Sorry, I don't know what the proper term is here. Yeah. Cell phone. So the best way to think about it is we're filming a documentary and there will be times where we ask like real general questions, where did you buy it, that sort of thing, and there'll, then there will be times where I'm going to say like, I want to set the scene. Who were you with? What time of day was it? If you're like online looking up phones, were you in your living room? Were you at your office? I, there's like all, all the details I want, right? So you can think of think of us like holding the camera, saying how do we how do we film this whole thing? Um, so no wrong answers. It's your story. So just whatever happened happened. If you can't remember something, that's fine too. So where did you buy your phone? Um, it's about three months ago. I just finished my three month um, probation period. I don't know. They gave me like a three month. Limitless data trial, so I've just finished that. So, so April? Yeah, so April, end of April? Yeah, sort of mid, 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 mid. And so, 
Was it, was it weekend, weekday? It's a weekend. Weekend. Saturday, Sunday? Saturday. Okay. So Yeah, it, because it was a bank holiday when it should have been delivered and then it had to be delivered on the Tuesday. Oh, so Monday was, was bank Wednesday. holiday. What would bank holiday have been? So that must have been May. <laughs> no, sorry, so do you know the No, day? it would be Easter weekend maybe. Yeah, Easter weekend. Easter weekend. We got that. Uh, so that. so you, have, you went like Good Friday was in that Friday yeah. and, and then Saturday's a like new phone. Yeah. And how how long have you been thinking about it? When did you have the first thought, like, oh my gosh, wait, 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 I want to play. So did you go to the store and buy it, or did you go did you no, order it? No, I bought online. Okay. And? I didn't talk to anybody. No, I talked to people on the, on the phone. But not online. Not so I, I researched it online, okay. and then um, I talked to a few people on the phone. I have been planning to, so I guess one of the reasons I haven't been doing it for a long time is because I've been planning to go into a store and try those phones. And that put me off because finding the time to do that and also being accosted by people in French shops. And so, did you ever do that? Did you ever walk into a. Okay. But you would. You, I mean, you but I played with other people's. Okay. You said the word accosted at a phone store. What does yes. that mean? Um, so, I think in my head it was like if you go into a phone store, you know, they <clears throat> make the sale, they want to get a commission. And, I didn't know what I wanted enough, and I'm quite um, susceptible to pressure um, from salespeople, so I was just really worried I'd end up like, making a decision that I didn't want to make to be nice. Why, why, do you have, why do you have that opinion of, when's the last time you were at a phone store I got <laughs> <laughs> um, Probably quite a while ago. It wasn't even me, it's probably... So you see what happened there? Now this was just the first five minutes of an hour-long interview. What they were able to establish was Becky, um, you know, wasn't able to remember accurately when she bought the phone. That was the first thing. And secondly, Becky was making decisions on not buying a certain phone based on the fact that she heard somebody had a bad experience at a phone store, and that's why she researched it online and she did not walk into a shop. So this is extremely valuable information if you happen to be a mobile service phone provider, right? How would you design your service? to fit someone who says, you know what, I think these people are really bad in the store. But the fact is, she never actually went through the experience herself. She was basing it on someone else's story. And it's through something like a story technique that you're able to figure out all these tiny little causes and effects that help us decide and end up what we do what we do. Um, uh, so this is also part of the jobs to be done. So it's a framework. This interview is, um, technique is part of the framework that Bob and Chris have developed. And I, I saw Bob's notebook, and he basically drew a rough like this. And so when, when he asked Becky, when did you have the first thought about when to buy a phone, he would actually scribble down here where it's the first event. Now, this particular timeline is kind of rough, but if you look really, really carefully, this is a three-act structure. Event one, event two, and the time you actually went and bought something. So it has a sort of basis of a three-act structure. Um, there's another way, there are other ways to use research. I can only cover two today. Um, this is another one which is very similar to what Aaron has shown you with Eliza, although that's sort of more translating. This is actually um, raw data, if you like, from, uh, from, from actual field work. So um, we spend some time with customers in order to understand their real context. Now, it's really hard to bring in a whole day's worth of research back to the office and say, hey, people, this is important. You need to understand who the, who the people are who are using our product. And so we did this thing called the customer documentary. And um, this is one of the first ones that we, we did uh, in collaboration sort of for, MailChimp, for MailChimp customers. And this happens to be a, a UX agency uh, in Brighton, in the UK, that uses the software. So I'm just going to show you a snippet of it. I probably won't show you, well, I won't show you the whole thing, but yeah, here you go. It's really, really noisy in the office. And sometimes when you yourself go to work, you don't actually realize what your environment is. And when we're designing for a customer that we can't see, something like this is a way to show, uh, in, in this particular case, I mean, uh, um, the software team was in the US, 
and we have customers all around the world. So something like a video shows you really different things, really different layout context. I mean, these, I don't know if you saw, there was a frame there where we took a photo of dead grass, well, sorry, plastic grass, because they were trying different surfaces for the new office. Um, and so they're all consumed about their move. They're busy. They may be using your software, but they're busy in different ways. So this actual video is about two years old now. Um, the technique that goes into making something like this is an entirely different skill set from what you expect to find in your user experience tool set. I took myself into making a, doc a workshop on making documentaries to figure out how to make something like this. And uh, there are very specific techniques, if you have worked in film before you know what they are, where you choose to cut a piece of uh, visual um, and also have continuing audio underneath. There are little techniques you can do in the editing of a video to make it compelling and to make it really difficult to put your eyes away and look somewhere else. Um, that's a technique, but there's also the story behind it. Um, when I did a workshop with a, a woman called Yolanda Barker, she has this really concise way of saying what you're looking for when you're driving forward a story. Um, she is a... Oh, She's a, 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 no, a very, she, she makes documentaries herself, and she had this thing, again, you find that people who work in other, other fields have a concise way of trying to say what they're trying to do. Um, so she says, plot, character, or question. If you're doing a documentary, you can drive the story by having a central character that you pay attention to and you follow them through the journey. So something, um, a, a lot of sort of uh, nature documentaries, like, you know, you watch a polar bear, and you feel empathy for the polar bear, and you follow them through the story. So that's very, very character-driven. Um, Plot-driven is when things happen to you. And the question-driven could be sort of like when you're unraveling a mystery. <clears throat> so circumstance, cause, time, a person, or an issue. Now, in the context of what we do, we, um, after we do this listening part, we have this thing that we call modeling. Now, modeling is not a word that we use really often, and I feel sad about it, um, mostly because it is one of the things that differentiates from the actual listening. We have to be really conscious that when you get to this part of the user experience process, what you're doing is you're interpreting information. Um, the kind of video I just showed you is a little bit of both because to make a video that way, you need to have some, you need to have the voice, you need to have the voice of the narrator, which is the hand of the editor. Um, but in this particular case, you, you're allowing, you're constructing user models, like this is the current truth that we know about our customers right now. And we have many, many tools in user experience right now. And really interestingly, if you actually took this apart, they pretty much all more or less fit into a story model. Um, and so, again, from what I've told you before, just having these little story aspects, character, plot, or question, character, plot, or place, um, allows you to sort of have a more comprehensive view of the data that you've collected and how to make sense of it. So, for example, customer journey maps. Um, this is a, a musketeer, and he may be using your product. How is the, uh, a customer journey map is one of those tools that you can probably, if you haven't used it before, you can read about it. There's plenty written about it. Um, it's a time-based thing. And obviously, the one I just showed you before with jobs to be done timeline is a time-based interpretation of what actually happens when users make decisions. Other examples I'll just pull out really quickly. And I'm not going to explain too much what they are because, again, this is something that you can find out if you've not if used it before yourself. A user story is an expression of a need, um, but it's tied to a character. It's a character's needs. And something like a job story is a description of a circumstance. So just in a quick summary, all our tools right now, which is really surprising when I actually stop to think about it, all our tools fit into a kind of a story-based thing because it's how we normally, basically, analyze information anyway. And so a user story is a description of character skull, and I'm just going to get to the last bit here. <clears throat> so, we already do this to some degree, but we're not conscious about it. Very, very much like how we treat stories. And the, um, the only thing that we haven't done well is to really give it credit for what it is, that we are dealing with stories and that we need to have a kind of a more, uh, a clearer framework of when we're using it and how we're using it. The last bit is one I want to focus on at this moment. Um, the drama, the consequence of decisions. Um, 
the best quote actually. So you know, you think that when you watch a police drama or something, or I don't know, pick in the TV series Breaking Bad. I don't know what's cool right now because I'm not very cool. Um, the um, so you think drama happens because a murder just happened. You know, they're running after the criminal. Blah blah blah. There's a chase. But actually, when you are a fiction writer, in especially crime fiction, where the drama comes from is in the human decision. And one of the most interesting tools we have. Uh, this actually applies to whether you work in teams, it applies to your friendships, your relationships. It's amazingly universal. Um, it's called the Cartman's Drama Triangle. Who's heard of this? Just out of curiosity, a few, okay. Um, it's just one of those most, sorry, one thing, threes, magic number, again, I don't understand. Um, the, um, so the Cartman drama triangle is based on transactional analysis. So if you've got a psychology, um, psychology background, you probably have come across this before. And the idea being that um, if yourself, if you feel like someone has hurt you, you would normally go to someone to say, you know, that person hurt me. All of us do this. And you expect that person to make you feel better. So you've nominated your rescuer at the same time you've chosen the prosecutor. Um, in the context of developing software, for example, how could this be used? So someone calls up help desk like, your software is awful, it's crap. And so who's the rescuer and who's the persecutor? So you can use this model to actually figure out where people fit and how they believe in, in the context of using, using your app or your software. As people who work in user experience, part of our job is to find these points of conflict, where they happen, throughout the time frame of when someone encounters our app and how we can resolve them. Now I'm going to move on to, very quickly, to the next bit, which is the stuff that many of us love doing, which is the design part. We have, again, lots of tools at our disposal. But one of the most interesting things I realized about storytelling and design, um, if you, I don't know, I guess I was obsessed. I, I read a lot about this in the last few years, and there was a peak of discussion about storytelling and, and design, web design especially, especially, between 2010 and 2013, and almost nothing afterwards. Something happened. I think what happened was responsive web design came in, and it changed the way we think about design. And so, you know, we all got diverted into thinking that we need to be lean, we need to be clean and small, and the story got ignored to some degree. And there were places where you find this, uh, how story manifests and how it's coming back. A lot of it is in video and audio. A lot of it is in podcast audio series like Serial, and you see sort of YouTube stories um, that people have produced. So it's in content, but in terms of design, it's not quite there, except for journalism and for um, data visualization. So I'm going to show you a really few quick examples. And actually, um, the, the example that, that uh, that Steve and Mark showed yesterday was actually a really good one, and, but that project was also several years ago. So there, there was something really odd in the last three years about why we're not doing this as much anymore. Um, it's the second time I mentioned Airbnb, but what I like here is that when you look at a video like this, you, have, you can imagine yourself as these people. Um, you're in a place, you're visiting somewhere new, you know, it's nice, um, and it sells you the idea without actually telling you very much, because you can imagine who they are. Now, this is the New York Times, and this is probably here is what interests me. So this is, again, journalism, because I guess it lends itself to that form of design. And you see that sort of timeline on the side here. And that is probably what, um, what Brad would call a, a design molecule for time-based things. And actually, quite a few newspapers have done this already in order to follow um, news that are being sort of, you know, uh, sort of um, what do you call it, news that are, are current headlines. Bloomberg does this really well. You can see this is character-driven. You pay attention to the faces, and you pay attention to how, um, you know, if you click on these, they'll have little details about it. So it's one way, again, story is being used, but in a very rudimentary way. This is in geography, in place. This one is the one I like. Um, it's going to run. OK, so this is a question-driven data visualization, which I've probably the only one I've ever seen, um, asking about the question, now, what's warming the Earth? And so it will model for you the data across a timeline, and you watch it, and you follow the questions, is it volcanoes? <clears throat> All right, I'm not going to let it run because it runs for a while. It's, uh, it's still visible. I only found that a few months ago. What bothers me, though, is that there's a tendency for us to talk about story as something on a screen. 
When we talk about storytelling and design, we talk about, oh, you know, it has to be, it has to be this thing on the screen, that on your phone. But that's not how design really functions in the real world. That's not how our users experience us in the, in the real world context. What I really, li I really liked what um, the guy said yesterday morning about designing static timelines, I'm sorry, designing timelines, but not static pages. That puts a story, but it's still on the screen. And so if someone encounters your product, so think about the last thing you bought. Was it a phone? Was it a pair of shoes? Was it a really fancy jacket? Or was it something really nice? Or something as simple as a pencil from a shop? Um, if it's a brand you know, you are going to think about it before you get there, you already know of it, or if you encounter it, you remember when you first heard it last or first used it last. So the, um, the time frame for when you encounter an app, a product, digitally, let's say, it can begin any time where you get encountered a brand story, but where you start interacting, so when you start you know, calling and say, um, hey, I, I really, well, I don't know, you can do an email these days, I suppose. You can email and say, hey, I'm really interested in this product, you're out of stock. When can you have it back in the shop? Or if you are stuck with something and you call a help desk, the service um, layer happens after the brand story. And then you have when someone actually comes to buy something from you online, from your e-commerce site, or if they go to you in the shop and then they see the sort of stuff that you have, is also partially only later on in time. And if we're thinking about just the short apps, the visual stuff that you develop, right? Think about this. The time spent on the stuff you create is only here, but the story spans either side for an infinite amount of time that we have no control over. Um, and some brands do this particularly well. Um, I really like Nike in that, sorry, I don't buy Nike products myself, but I like what they do in terms of really strong storytelling. And it's not much, um, you don't see much in terms of visually, but what they have here is a concept of a hero, and that when you're using their product, you are the hero. So it, you know, it occurs on even down the sub pages um, that you could be this hero. Uh, the only problem I have with this particular page is I click women's products, and I'm pretty sure that's a man. Anyway, <clears throat> um, now I'm going to show you one more example because we don't have a lot of time. Um, this is a shop that, unless you live in the UK, you probably have never heard of. <clears throat> These guys. Um, they are an online grocery. They deal. Uh, they sell predominantly organic food. Um, they also so they they sort of grown a lot in the last three four years. They um, so they're in competition with a typical supermarket, but they're online only and they deliver a box to your house the same time every day um, every week once a week. And um, so what what's fascinating about these guys is so I always get a printed recipe in my box and it looks exactly the same tone, the same visual voice but also the same language. If you pay attention to how they do things, um, so organic lamb, they, have, they identify where it comes from, but they tell you the character and the place. So all of a sudden, the lamb that you have has a source, and you realize that sort of it, it does a few things. It makes you appreciate that someone actually brought up the food that you ate. Um, and, they cook. and so this is meat, and I know that we, are, we have a um, sensitivity to, to how we understand animals and how we uh, consume them. But vegetables, they do the same thing. So um, cherry tomatoes, um, let, it's a bit too small, so let me try and read that to you. Our organic cherry tomatoes are round, juicy numbers, full of flavor. So all of a sudden, these aren't just any tomatoes. These are cute little organic tomatoes that are really juicy. And this is coming across in the copy. Again, they do the similar thing with the producer. So at this time of year, because it's getting cold in England, um, they're grown by Andreas in Almeria in Spain. So like, you know the name of the guy who grew these tomatoes, and you know where they came from and why. So story doesn't have to be a big, huge visual thing. A story can be really in the choice of a few words, and literally, I would say, I count the dozen words in here. That's just enough to give you a sense of place and the value of the product that you're buying. So, story elements. Um, you can use them to suggest a story or to drive a story forward in design. So you don't have to sort of bomb, you know, bombastically blast everyone with what your story is. Um, if you sort of noticed the very, very beginning of the session where I talked about those cats, I only gave you enough information to be a story. It wasn't really technically a story. I gave you enough information. I gave you a time, spring 2013. I gave you a place, 
Belgrade. I gave you a bit of context about the place, really old, lots of wars fought over there. And I gave you characters, which was kind of me, but it was mostly the cats. And cats are perfectly fine as characters, it turns, as it turns out. And um, so what happens is because a story, when I tell you a few things, the reason why you started paying attention is because you start forming the story in your head. I just gave you this huge bucket and you started filling things in on your own. That's what completes a story. A story is not me telling you every single detail and fact that would be it's like a Charles Dickens novel or something. Um, but in which case, it would be just me giving you just enough information for you to complete the story in your own mind. And uh, not to sort of beat this down too much, but the three elements I've given you, character and role, place, plot and time, these are so, so simple. Just these three things is enough to get a story going. And when you drive the story forward, it's really about whether it's, in our circumstances, because we're dealing with nonfiction, its plot is character's question. Time frame, what's happened? What are they struggling with? And once you can have this in a way, you've already got, you've already got a story. In closing, this is an interview, a BBC interview between, between um, Bridget Candell and uh, who's an arts, I think she's an arts correspondent, um, and, uh, and Will Self, an author. Now, I want to show you this because he makes a really, really astute point about why we're fascinated with stories. But nonetheless, we do have um, a big sympathy for the narrative, don't we? The idea of a story, that something happened, it carried on, it finished. And it feels as though in your novels you're saying to the reader, I want you to work a bit harder than that. Well, no, it's not so much that. It's just, you know, Oliver Twist, lost in central London, just happens to meet his grandfather. You know, I don't know about you, but my life really doesn't seem to have had a plot. Uh, certainly not a plot that turns on coincidence in a big way or serendipity. Uh, you know, my life seems pretty formless and baggy. One event seems to follow another. I largely don't have control of things. I don't know if people who are listening to this feel they're deeply in control of their lives. If they do, they're probably psychotic. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I think the reason we reverence these aspects of, of fiction uh, and narrative is because we wish our lives were like that. But it's certainly how we view them in retrospect. We impose narrative structures on them. But it's not really how they're lived. So we all make stories to make sense of our own lives. And it seems really silly that we don't pay attention to things when, you know, shouldn't we exploit this tendency for story in everything that we do, especially when we're designing things for other human beings to make each other's lives better? Thank you.